It's time to praise his name, church. You all stand and sing. We're going to start out this worship service with our God. And in a world of so much uncertainty, it is so um, just, I'm grateful. And it fills me with peace to know that we have a God who is certain and who loves us and who stands true. So you guys sing this with us.
guys may be seated. Excited to be here today, and um, glad that you're with us, and those watching on our broadcast, and and uh, we're just glad you're here. The excitement in this place today, Amen, Amen. I'm telling you, I'm just um, uh, getting ready to start a new series. So whether you, this is your first time here or you haven't been here in a while, man, you picked a good week to come because we're getting ready to start a series on the life of David, and we're gonna we're gonna take and look at, at David and um, from shepherd to the king. And, you know, the Bible is given to us as Christ followers. If, you're, if you are a Christ follower, the Bible is given to us so that we can see how we are to live our life. In other words, this is, it's our life instruction book. And whenever we look at it, we see how that people that followed what God wanted them to do, how he blessed them and how they were, you know, they were glad walking with the Lord. And then there are those that didn't, and we see how, you know, because they weren't following the Lord and walking with the Lord, they missed out on a lot of things that God wanted them to do. And so I want to encourage you today as we look into the life of day, we're going to look at five weeks is what I'm planning on, five different stories. And through these stories, some of them you've heard of before, but we're going to take a little bit different perspective. 
And we're going to see how it's going to affect your life because that's what the Bible is for. It's not just to hear a story. It's not just about what David did. It's what God wants to do in and through you and how David was successful in certain areas and how that it can work the same way with you if we do what he did. So the story we're talking about today took place in 11th century B.C. And uh, we find out a lot of things about David, but we're first introduced to David as a boy. I mean, he's just a little you know, young teenage boy, and uh, when we first start learning about him. But we find out that David lived during a very violent time. I mean, it was violent. It's hard for us to even understand how violent that this time period was, especially ancient warfare. I mean, this was a time period that it was rough. Now, Hollywood has tried to do a great job in in, uh, trying to give us a picture of what it was like, like uh, Braveheart, you know, and, and Mel Gibson, and, and then, you know, later on, th- th- there's other movies that were made, like Gladiator, and, uh, but it has no way, there's no way we can truly understand what it was like to live in such a violent, violent time during the ancient times and ancient warfare, and so, really, in order to understand it, you had to be there, and you had to smell it, you had to, you had to have the fear of what these men would go through during this time of warfare. I mean, you would literally, see, now we look at this from a distance. We look at it through a video, through a movie. But when you were there and you were in ancient warfare during the time of David, I mean, you were seeing eye to eye with your enemy. It wasn't from a distance because today's way we fight is through missiles and, you know, a lot of that. You don't go soldier to soldier anymore. For the most part. And, and so here during this time, you were just an arm length away when you were at war. And you would look into the eyes of your opponent. And you would look and you would either see fear or you would see terror. Or you would see the glaze in their eyes from where they had drank enough to have enough courage to come out there and fight you and scream and, uh, scream and yell and try to kill you. I mean, you're right there at the edge of the shield. You're, you're right face to face with the enemy. And the worst thing that you can see during this time was calm. Because if it was calm, you was facing a real veteran warrior. And unless you were a veteran warrior, most likely you were going to die. Because they had more experience than you had. But it was only after the battle that you realized whether you were wounded or not. Because during the time of this warfare, the adrenaline was so rushed. I mean, it wasn't until that adrenaline ended that you knew if you were even wounded or not. And if you were wounded, you had to figure, or, or while you were trying to figure out if you were wounded, you were looking at the blood all over your body because you're man-to-man combat. There's blood, there's your blood, his blood. And whenever you figure out whether or not you're really wounded, you know, it's after the battle. I mean, this is serious. During this time, these battles were tough. And if you were wounded, the odds were in that day and time that the infection would set in and you would eventually die. And during this time, a a lot of men would would fight naked. You say, why in the world would they do that? Because they knew, they know a lot about germs, but they knew that if their wound took their clothing into their skin, like into their arm or into their leg, most likely they would lose that arm or they would lose that leg. And so during this time, this is some serious, serious warfare that's going on. You try to figure out, you know, hey, you're looking at this guy. You're looking at your opponent. And all of a sudden, it's bad. It's terror. Many men fought. They were probably scared to death. There's some thinking, this is my last day here on earth. And if you're fighting and your brother to your right or to your side, your, your, your fellow con- uh, men of the army, if they turn and ran, you were surely probably going to die. And by the time they come and got your body, the birds and the animals probably have been eating you up. Isn't that just a great introduction? <laughs> but this is just kind of giving you an idea of the time that David lived in, the violence, the things that people saw, and the warfare that took place. And I want to go into 1 Samuel chapter 7. And I didn't have room to write all these scriptures because we're going to read the story and we're going to go through some things and I want you to understand. But here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to see a story that you're probably familiar with. But I want to look at it from a perspective maybe you haven't thought about. Let's start with verse 1 in chapter 17. The Bible says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled 
at Soko in Judah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. And then in verse 3, the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Verse 4, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was about six cubits in a span. Now, this is about nine and a half foot tall. I don't know a lot of people that are tall. This is a giant. This is a big guy. Look at verse 7. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. Now, that's about 15 pounds. Now, this thing was about six foot long. It had this big piece of steel on the end of it that was, that was about 15 pounds. And no doubt, Goliath probably stood back on the second line, you know, the army, reaching over the first line, and he could just take and he could just kill and kill and kill and kill and kill with this spear. I mean, this is a giant. This is a, this is a veteran warrior that's coming out, and he's challenging Israel. Look what he says in verse 8. Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Saul was the king of Israel. He was, by the way, he was the first king, in case you didn't know that. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. But then he says this, Choose a man and have him come down to me. And then in verse 9, If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then in verse 10, Then the Philistine, which was the giant, said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Verse 11, On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And I want you to remember those words, dismayed and terrified. King Saul and the army, they're dismayed. And they're terrified. Goliath will come out and do this week after week. He's taunting them. And now Israel needs a champion. And so what do they do? They look to the, the tallest person, which was their king. They look to their king to come out and match up against this guy. And why did they look to the king? For number one, he was the king. <laughs> and number two, he was the tallest guy. One of the reasons why he was chosen to be the king was because he was the tallest the Bible says he was head and shoulders over the rest of the army. He was big. And so they're looking. They're waiting for Saul. Saul, man, come out and fight this guy, man. You're with us. You know, and, and, and now Saul is nowhere to be found. And the giant walks out and he challenges the nation of Israel. And Israel's looking for their king. And they have placed their hope in this king, Saul. And by placing their king, they waited for him to come out, and they placed their hope in him, and he never came out. And so as they're waiting, and they're waiting for their king to come out, of course, the army, they're getting discouraged. They're getting, you know, like, where is he? Where is he? Why is he not doing anything about this? And so fear has set into the camp. They were terrified, the Bible says. And this is where our story kind of lines up with what's going on here. It's kind of our, our lives are going to kind of intersect, because look at this. Look at this. You can write, fill this in in your outlines. We place our hope in what we depend on. We place our hope in what we depend on. That's just the way it is. Or we place our hope in who we depend on. That's where your hope is. And their army, their hope was in the king. Their, their hope was in him. And so here they are, and, and, and they're putting their hope. And you know what? Whenever we put our hope in someone and they disappoint us, this is where our anger and our disappointment comes from because someone that we put our hope in, they disappoint us. It's true with you as parents, you know? It's like this is why, you know, maybe you resent your parents because anytime we put our hope in somebody, which is a lot of times your parents, and it may still be for you now, and then they disappoint us, it hurts us, and we become angry. I mean, you, you know, your parents make you so mad sometimes, but you, know, you can go right across the street and see your neighbor and, and those, those adults, and you're very nice to them. You're polite to your neighbor, <laughs> to your parents. You put your hope in them. When they disappoint you, you become angry with them. And it's true with us as parents as well, just to kind of give you this kind of idea. I mean, you know, your, your son and daughter can go out with some friends, you know, and and, and they're so polite to them, they're so nice to them, and you go, yeah, I knew it was in them. Why can't they do that at home? 
Or somebody brings them home, right? They've been out with some adults, and they bring them home, and they go, man, your kids, your son, man, is, got, he, is so, he is so well-mannered, and your daughter is so polite. Man, they're just awesome. And you turn around and look and say, did you bring the right kids home? You know, it's like, because who we put our hope in is who we depend on. But a lot of times, that's the source of our anger and our disappointment is who we put our hope in. That's just a natural way. But they had put their hope in the king. Now, Saul in this story, he's missing, right? And every day that he's missing, now, again, the army, is their, their faith and their hope is just dying. And the whole army is just discouraged now. And so God never wanted a king anyway. Let me just say this. Saul was the first king, but Saul did, I mean, God didn't want the king. God wanted everybody, in, in, all the Israelites, to look at him as the king. They wanted them to put their hope in him is what God wanted. But you see what happened was is wherever you place your hope is who you're going to depend on, and God wanted them to do that. But what happened was was they were looking around at these other nations, and they were watching you know, what was going on, and they started leaning to, we want a king started getting their eyes off of God and saying, hey, we want a king like all these other nations. And that's the way you and I do in our life. You see, God's got a purpose and God's got a plan for your life. And all of a sudden you start looking at everybody else's life and you get your eyes off God and you lose your purpose. And this is what's happened to God's chosen people. He has a purpose for this nation and they're getting their eyes off and now they're saying, we want a king. Well, 400 years before this incident, God set up a theocracy in Israel. You say, well, what is a theocracy? That's where he pretty much gives the, the, some, the nation some laws, and then they are administered by the judges. And that's the way God has set up the nation of Israel. He wanted him to be the, he wanted, God wanted himself to be the king, but he was going to give this nation some laws, and then he wanted to have some judges in place to administer these laws. And this was going to make it different than any other, any, other, any other thing because, again, exactly where Israel had come from was Egypt, right? And what did Egypt have? They had a, a leader. They had Pharaoh. They had a person in charge that they all looked to. And, and so all these other nations had kings, and now they're looking around, and they say, we need a king. We want a king. This wasn't what God wanted. And so they looked to the person that was in charge, which would be the prophet, and this was Samuel. And so they go to Samuel and say, hey, look, Samuel, we want a king, dude. Everybody else has got one. All the cool kids have a king. All the cool nations have a king. Why do we not have a king? And so he's complaining. And then Samuel, in, in chapter 8, let's go back a few chapters. We were in 17, but let's go back to chapter 8 and verse 1. Because this has happened a few years before the Goliath incident. But look, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's judges. In other words, he knew he was getting old. He needed to replace somebody. So he put his sons in the place of the judge. But his sons did not follow his ways. This is verse 3. I'm sorry. Verse, skip down to verse 3. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. In other words, Solomon was a good man, but his sons were corrupt, man. In other words, the cases that, that whoever had the most money is the way the case went. They were in it for gain for themselves. They weren't in it for the right reason. So here you are, judges, doing this. And, and so the, verse 4, so the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. In verse 5, they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But here's the thing that they forgot. This was not what God wanted. God had a purpose for Israel. God, the nation of Israel was designed and set up for a purpose. And it wasn't just for the purpose of them. This was going to be a purpose that was going to be change everything in the whole world. You see, many, many years before this, God had made a promise to a man that you probably heard of, Abraham. And in Abraham, he says, look, I'm going to bless your descendants. I'm not just going to bless your family. I'm not just going to bless you. No, I'm going to bless the nation of Israel, and I'm going to bless the entire world. It's going to come from you, Abraham. That was a promise that he made, Father Abraham. And so here the descendants are coming. This is where the nation of Israel starts, and God's got a purpose. He's going to bring the king through this nation. But he had some laws for this nation to follow. He wanted them to follow these laws and stay focused, and he wanted to be their one true king. God wanted Israel to be like no other nation. Why? Because he was going to prosper them. He was going to do things through them that the people were going to say, Who is your God? Do you see the picture now? He's got a purpose for the nation of Israel. 
It wasn't just a special group that he liked. No, it was a purpose that he was going to do through them to bring the king that's going to bless the whole world. So follow the laws I've given you. Stay, stay in your lane. Stay what you're supposed to do and keep focused on these laws. And now they're going against it. And they're saying, we want a king. But no, they wanted, he wanted people to say, who is your God? Because of all the blessings that were coming. 1 Samuel 8, and let's look at, look at verse 6 now. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, who was the prophet. And so he prayed to the Lord. And as he prayed to the Lord, look at verse 7. The Lord responds, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. This is the nation of Israel who had a purpose, just like he's got a purpose for you. He's got a purpose for your life. And we wander and we go off of that purpose because we want to do what we want to do. We want to listen to everybody else and watch what's going on around us. And that's what the nation of Israel is doing. And now they want to go against what God has said to do. Verse 9. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as rights. In other words, let the people know it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be simple like they think it is. Because when you get a king, what happens? He's going to tax you. He's going to take a percentage of your crops. He's going to take a percentage of your herds. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your daughters, and they're going to become servants. He's going to claim the best land. And yet, in spite of all these warnings that they got, they still wanted a king, just like you and I in our life. We get all these warnings for the purpose and what God wants to do in our life. And we don't listen to it. And this is where the nation of Israel is. And I want to show you what happens here in this story. Because we see when we obey the Lord and his purpose for our life, great things can happen that will just blow your mind. But when you and I start looking left and looking right and looking at this world and the things of this world, and our hope depends, we put our hope in ourselves or in someone else. You're going to be dissatisfied, and you're going to be let down. But through this, wanting a king is now going to come into the story of King David that we have. And, and David was the second king, as we're going to see later on. And he was arguably the greatest king of all times. But he was not the greatest king because he was a perfect man or a perfect king. He was, he was perfect. I mean, he was, he was the greatest king because there was something about him that was reluctant. You can write that in your notes. He was reluctant. He was extraordinarily confident, but he was extraordinary, extraordinarily humble. You see, that's some characteristics that a lot of times you don't see together. But this is what David was. He was very confident, but he was also very, very humble. And something else about David, he loved the law. And that was not normal for a king. The kings don't like laws. In other words, when a king, when king does something he doesn't like a law, what does he do? He changes the law to meet it for what he wants it for because he's the king. But David wasn't like that. And, and through the writings of David and Psalms, you will see that David loved the law. Why did he love the law? Because he knew that the law that had been given to them come from, the God for, from God for the nation of Israel, and he believed that. He loved the law so much that he allowed it to condemn him. When he did wrong because he wasn't perfect. He didn't change the law like other kings did. No, he succumbed to it. In other words, he allowed the law to rule his life. And because of this, it gave him extraordinary, extraordinary clarity in the decisions that he made. You see, he was confident, but he was humble. David never confused, he was never confused about the identity of Israel's true king. David, no matter what he did, he always knew who was the true king. He never placed himself as the true king of Israel. He always humbled himself before them, despite the popularity, the talent, the success, the power that was given to him. He never got confused, but a lot of us, it's not the case. We get confused. We get a little bit successful. Something good happens, and we kind of sometimes, and this can happen to any of us, we kind of think, I am kind of good at this. Hitting. I am kind of smart on it. I'm the smartest person in this room. Boy, I just hit a home run right there, didn't I? Yeah, toot my horn. Yeah, and, and it's like, you know, and all of a sudden we start putting a little more hope in ourselves, don't we? And David never did that. And you'll see that in his writings. David, the king of Israel, never made that 
mistake. But a lot of times we'll put ourselves on our own throne and become king of our own life. And that's where you and I can't do that. We can't do that. Now, we're going to catch a glimpse of, of, of David's perspective as a 15-year-old boy. Let's go back to the story in chapter 17. Let's pick up in verse 11. Because David just wanted to stay out of his way of, the, of his brothers. who were His brothers were in the army. They were, you know, warriors, and David was just a shepherd boy. But look, what, look in verse 11. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. That's where we ended a while ago. They were dismayed and terrified. Now, while this is going on, a 15-year-old boy, a little shepherd boy, is going to take a care package down to the military line. So he's going to see where the war is going on. And so he's going down there, and just like any curious teenage boy, he wants to know what's going on, don't he? He wants to say, what's up? You know, and so he's going to go down. Well, something is going on, and so he gets a little closer, like, you know, like, like most boys would do. I want to find out what's going on, man. I'm going to squeeze through here and, and find out what's going on. And here David is. He hears Goliath as he steps out and makes this speech that he makes several times a day. He's been doing it for weeks. He comes out here, and, come on, bring somebody on to challenge me. And when David heard this, he wasn't dismayed and terrified. Guess what he was? He was offended. <laughs> He was offended, not like the rest of the army. He saw something different. He saw something different. Here's a warrior. Here's a giant that's coming up and threatening the, the, is the nation of Israel, the one of the only true God, and he's making a threat, and he gets offended. And so he starts asking some questions, and as we see these questions in the verses I'm getting ready to read, as you see these questions come, you're going to see the clarity that he has. Let's look at verse 26. Skip down to verse 26. David asked the men that were standing near him. In other words, the ones that were what? Dismayed and terrified. He looks at them and he says, What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Talking about the giant. Do you see the confidence there? Do you see him step up and say, Hey, what's going on here? And you can imagine the men. Dude, why are you even asking a question like that, man? You know, who do you think you are? You know, do, and what do you mean by disgrace? Remove this disgrace. I mean, we don't even look at it this way. We see a nine foot nine or nine foot six giant. We see a big, huge giant who's a warrior, man. It's going, you know, this guy, this dude is for real. We expected our king to come out and fight him, and he's nowhere to be found. We can't even find Saul, man. He won't, he won't come out of his tent, or he won't come from wherever he's from. And then look at the rest of verse twenty six. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? <laughs> I love that. He calls him uncircumcised Philistine, which means what? You know, what, what is he saying about Goliath? He's saying, hey, Goliath is outside the protection of God. He's not under the protection of God. Who, why should we be afraid of him? Hey, they're trying to take land, guys, that, that God's already told us is ours. Who does he think he is? Why, doesn't some, why hasn't somebody done something about this? This is David. This is his perspective. This is the way he's looking at this situation. He's like, why haven't we taken this, this, this dude out, man? He faced a giant. The whole nation of Israel is dismayed and terrified. They're tore up. And this little 15-year-old boy comes down with a confidence in his truth, God, and the situation. Word gets back to King Saul. It gets back to him. In other words, King, King Saul is like, wow, there's really some nut going to go out here and fight this guy? <laughs> Must be one of my warriors. I guess he's ready to commit, you know, he's ready to die. He's ready to go because it's going to be his last day on earth. I mean, this is the mentality of Saul. You know, how are we ever going to overcome this giant? Maybe that's the way you are in your life right now. How am I ever going to overcome this? And you're looking at how big your problem is and not how big your God is. Holy Spirit speaking to somebody today. You're still complaining about the same thing that's in your life, just like these guys on the front row are watching this guy come every day to the front line. They're watching it, and they're terrified, and they're just dismayed, and they're like, woe is us. And they don't really truly believe that the God has this problem. And for some of you today, it's time that you give that problem to God and believe that he is who he says he is. So David walks into to where Saul is, and, and David walks in, and all of a sudden, Immediately, King Saul is dis, dis, dissatisfied. He's discouraged. 
He doesn't see a warrior. He sees no scars. He doesn't see any experience of where this guy has ever even fought. And immediately Saul dismisses him and says, no. David says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know, I'm just a shepherd boy. I know I've never got, I don't have any military experience. I don't have any weapons. But let me tell you about what's happened in my life as a shepherd. You see, there was a sheep. And I had like 100 sheep, and there was one that the that, that lion came and took, took it away. And instead of me just protecting the 99, I said, no, 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 that lion's not going with my sheep. I'm going to get it. He says, I went and I got that lion, and I took that sheep from him, and I got my sheep back, and I killed that lion, 15-year-old boy. He says, not long after that, I was still shepherding, and a bear came and took one of my lambs. And instead of protecting the other lambs against the bear, I took off after that bear, and I got that bear, and I got my lamb back, and I killed that bear. And look what he says in the next scripture. Let's look down to verse 36. And your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. <laughs> not because I'm a soldier, not because I have any military experience, but look in verse 37. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Absolutely no confusion here. He wasn't putting himself up as this great warrior. No, but he was putting the king of kings and lord of lords in the top of his life and in his situation. He knew the promises that he had made that God would come through. David is stepping out. He's got extraordinary clarity. I mean, he is focused. If it's, it's not just the enemy of God's people, it's the enemy of God. And David's assumption was this, that the man or woman whose hope is in the Lord need not fear. Listen to me. The man or woman whose hope is in the Lord, you don't need to fear. Why? Because he's there. He's there. He's got a purpose. You're walking with the Lord. He's got a purpose. We don't need to be afraid. He has got this, and you don't have to worry. And David's like, pick me, pick me, choose me. I want to go, king, please let me go. I'll do what no other soldier will do. King, I'll even do what you're not willing to do. I'll go and do it, and my God will prevail. My God will prevail. And we know that David will later on become the king, and he's going to write a lot of poetry, and he's going to write psalms. And when you read psalms, he wrote a lot of the psalms. And not only do we know what he did and what he said, but when you read the Psalms, you get into David's mind. <laughs> you get into his thoughts. You get into his emotions. You get into these things that's going on in David's life, and we can learn a lot through David's life. And let's look at this, what he wrote down in Psalm 25 and verse 1. This is going to be our, our key verse that I want you to do, and I'm going to challenge you here at the end. Apply this every day to your life. But look at this, Psalm 25 and verse 1. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. In you. Lord my God, I put my trust. So what do you put your hope in, David? Is it your talent? Is it your power? Is it your strength? Is it your influence as king? No, no, no. I place my hope is in the Lord. He was very clear on that. Over and over through the Psalms, you'll see that. You'll see him write these things. My hope is in you. My hope is in you. You see, this is the posture that God wanted for the nation of Israel. And he wants for all of us. He wants us to say, my hope is in you. I trust in you, my Lord. Nothing else. I depend on you to get me through this day. I depend on you to handle the things that come my way, whether it be good or whether it be bad. It's not me. It's not what I do. It's what you do in and through my life. And as we find out, you know, as he becomes the second king, you're going to see that the second king, David, he's going to have this posture, and he's going to lead in this way, and we're going to see this. But let's skip down to Psalm 25 and verse 3. No one hopes in you will ever be put to shame. He writes something that kings don't write. He writes a thought that kings don't normally embrace. But look what he writes in verse 5. Skip down to verse 5. He says, guide me. Now, he's the king. <laughs> guide me. The king is telling somebody to guide him. You see the humbleness coming through. It's not me. It's not I. It's him. He's my king. I'm just the king of this nation right here, but he's the king of kings. And he writes this. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. It's not me, Lord, it's you. I will go fight these people. I will go fight this giant. And I'll go in your name, and I know I will defeat because you are on my side and you've told me to do it. Here we go back to the story. 15-year-old boy, he walks down. He's clear-eyed. He's confident. He's humble. He makes his way down the valley. Listen to this. We can only imagine when he walked down into that valley, because we already said that Philistines are on one hill, 
Israelites on the other. Goliath keeps coming down and says, fight me, fight me, fight me. So David goes down into the valley. Can you imagine the Philistines going, hey, who, who's that? That's a boy. <laughs> it's a boy, and he's got no weapons. <laughs> Can you imagine the laughter that just started happening when this little boy walked down that hill ready to face Goliath and fight him? Can you imagine the Israelites on the other hill? It's a boy. Oh, my gosh. It's a boy. And we've heard the threats of Goliath and the, the deal that he made that whoever wins, hey, if they defeat us, we're going to be their servants. And our king has sent a boy. I bet all of a sudden some of them started saying, no, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> don't send this boy, man, we're going to be slaves to them forever. Can you imagine what was going on? We don't really know how they felt, but I'm telling you, Goliath continues to make these threats, and David waits, and he looks at Goliath, and he says this, you come to me with sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, amen? The God of Israel, amen? <laughs> and I'm going to take you down. He goes down with confidence. He goes down, and he says this, hey, you have defied my God. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you what the future is getting ready to hold for you. That's right. This is what's getting ready to happen to you. The whole earth is going to know that, I, that there is a God, that I am going to defeat you, because when I come down here, I am going to take you out. Listen to me. Before this day is over, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field are going to eat your dead body. <laughs> He's, listen to me. God is going to deliver me. I mean, deliver you into my hands, and you're going to die today. Can you imagine what this nine-foot-six giant is thinking to this little boy? And guess what? David took him out. He killed him. And all of a sudden, David became really popular. And all of a sudden, David became the most feared man of the Philistines. David was now the man. Did he lose perspective? No. It's because I come in his name. It's because he fights my battles. This is the Lord's battle. It was not my battle. It's the Lord's battle, and he's going to take care of it. And then the Philistines made a huge mistake. They made a huge mistake. They turned and they ran. And the Bible says that it took a whole day of slaughter to kill them. And they left a lot of their stuff and back at the camp, and Israel just took all their stuff. Wiped them out. Killed many, many, many of them. And took down the giant. And it is so. Those. Who put their hope in the Lord. Those who. Men. Women. Student. Teenager. Those who put their hope in the Lord. They see clearly. Fill in the blank. See clearly. They act confidently. And they walk humbly. These are life's way. That a Christ follower should walk. This is the representation. Why? Because God wants to, wants, when we act this way, God wants people to see who is your God? How can you be like that through the midst of your trial? How can you handle these things? And David says, it's because I come in the name of the Lord. It's the Lord's battle. It's not mine. Let me just tell you something. This is huge. This is the takeaway. This is key. You can't control outcomes. I can't control outcomes. You know why? Because there are too many variables that we can't control. And we think we can. We think we can handle all these situations. We think we can handle all these, th all these things in our life. But there's too many variables. But I'm glad that I know the king who has the control of the outcome and all the variables right here in his hand. He's the one that can do it. You and I can't, and there's nobody in this world that can. And maybe you're, putting, you're dependent and putting your hope in somebody else, and it's just going to let you down and you're going to be discouraged. It's not until you put your hope into the Lord that you're going to really truly depend on him because we can't control outcomes. This is what I want you to do. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. Let's say that together. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. You can do better than that. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. I challenge you every morning before you get out of the bed, you quote this, and you say this, and you declare it to the Lord that no matter whether it's good or whether it's bad that happens this day, 
You're going to walk in with him. In other words, you're not going to get hung up on pride because something good happens and really think that you are something, but you're going to be confident and you're going to walk humbly. In any situation that comes, there's nothing that God cannot handle. And that's the way we're going to live our life. That's the difference in the nation of Israel, those warriors and the, and the uh, men of the army, and David. David come in and said, hey, why hasn't any? Somewhere along the line, he had decided, hey, and he wrapped his life around the truth of God's word and promises that he had made. Have you wrapped your life around that? Have you really wrapped your life that no matter what comes your way, good or bad, you're going to walk confidently and you're going to walk humbly and you're going to have clarity because you do so. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. Even when those moments when things turn bad, in you, Lord my God, I put my trust. Thousands of times David must have said that. That was what he lived by. It's in his songs. That he wrote, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. The question I have for you in the midst of your storm is your hope in the Lord. The lesson that we learn here is we see David's different than the other nation of Israel. He's different. He immediately said, okay, here's the situation. I'm not going to freak out and panic. (laughs) I got the big warrior on my side. He's going to fight my battles. I may go, but he's going to have his power involved in this. And we didn't go into the way that Goliath was killed, but it was a miracle of God. It was God's power. It was him who fought the battle. What about you? In the midst of your storm, in the midst of your circumstances, do you put your hope in the Lord? Or do you find yourself complaining a lot to everybody about woe is me? Or do you lock yourself in a room and go... I got it so bad. If you're a child of God, you've got everything you need. You got everything. Things may not go the way you want, but I'll guarantee you if God's allowed it to happen, He wants to use it for His honor and glory. To strengthen you. And as I always say, strengthen those or draw the ones that are around you that need you. Our hope is in the Lord. All day long. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your blessings. Holy Spirit, I pray you move right now. I pray that you'll move in the lives of people. And Lord, that you will do what only you can do right now. If you're here today and you're trying to control your outcome of a situation, I pray that you'll pray right now. Just, just You start praying. As I'm talking, you just pray and say, Lord, I cannot do this because I can't control the variables. But I know you can. God, I know what you're, what's go, you know what's going on in my life. And I believe that you can handle it. This fight is yours. And I'm going to trust in you. And I'm going to put my hope in you always. I'm going to see clearly be confident and said I'm going to be humble because it's not me it's what you can do I'm just going to have faith if that's you I want you to just pray right now you just pray and say dear Lord I've been trying to control this I've been trying to fix this out I've been worrying myself to death about a situation that's going on but in you Lord my God I put my trust my hope is in you all day long. That's a life verse that every one of us needs to memorize. It needs to be a part of our everyday life. And that's the way we should walk, looking at the life of King David. God gave the nation of Israel because of a man that realized that he didn't have control of the outcome, but he knew the one that did, and he placed his faith there. Father, I pray for brothers and sisters that are here today and, and they're struggling. And Lord, I pray that they realize that We don't have to fear just because something comes in our life that we can't control. That's just an opportunity that, that Lord, we give to you to show us how big of a God you really are and that you've got a purpose for our life and you've got a plan for our life. Lord, I just pray that you'll give us all courage to be like David. When we see the problem, we don't get terrified and, and just be full of fear. We just go, hey, this giant is here. 
And my God's going to take care of it. And I'm not going to be afraid. As you continue to pray, maybe there's some of you here and you, you walked in here and, and uh, maybe you're, you're not a Christian, you're not a Christ follower, you're maybe not even a church person, but you're here today and I'm glad you're here. But let me tell you something. You can't control the outcome of your life. You can't. Maybe you already know that. You've been trying. There's just too many things outside of your ability to control. Even though you try, there's too many things that's going on that you can't control. And what you need is you need Jesus. You need to have your sins forgiven and to become a part of the family of God. Because that's when you can get the help that you need. That's when you get the source of hope and the source of help that you need in this life. Because apart from Jesus, we have no hope. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, my prayer and the prayer of many people in here is that you receive Christ today as your Lord and Savior. See, you say, well, what must I do? Because there's a lot of times, maybe you're watching the broadcast, there's, there's sometimes people say, well, what, I don't know what, what, I, what I do to receive Christ. Christ has already done the work. It's nothing you can do. It's nothing I could do to receive Christ other than call out to Him because our sin separates us from God and, and that's why Jesus went to the cross and He died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And then God raised Him from the dead three days later and we have a risen Savior. You say, why did He do all that? Because He was sinless. Jesus was the sacrifice because He did not have sin. He was the only one that could do it. And He did that and then He allows us to choose Him He's already chose us. He's already done what we needed to be done. But now He wants you to choose Him. You say, well, what do I do? But you need to confess your sin and realize that you are a sinner and that Jesus did that for you. And you need to turn from your old life, repent of that old life, and say, I, I want to get rid of that old person, and I want to be the new person in Christ and follow Him. And mean it with all your heart. It's not just this prayer of get out of hell free card. This is serious. I want to walk with Jesus. And if that's you and you've never done that before, you say, Pastor, I want to receive Christ. I'm going to pray and I want you to pray with me. You don't have to pray exactly what I'm praying, but pray something like this. Say, Dear Jesus, I need you. I need you. And I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins. I don't want to live my old life anymore. I want to walk with you because I know that's the right way. And you can control things that I can't control. And you can show me my purpose. And that's what I want to know. I surrender my life to you. If you're here this morning and you said that and you men are afraid of something like that and you ask him to forgive you, at that moment, he says, if you confess him, he will forgive you of your sins. You become a new creature in Christ. You become a new creation, a new person. And now my, I encourage you to find your purpose. You just start walking with Him. And you say this verse that we talked about every day of the week. Every, I, I trust in you, Lord. My hope is in you all day long. And you just walk with Him and let Him show you things. You say, I don't have to fear anymore because I've got God on my side. You say, Pastor Carl, that was me. I'm here today. And I know the reason I'm here today is because I needed Jesus. And I meant it with all my heart. If that's you and you're here today, I want you to raise your hand right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. I don't want to point you out. That's not my goal at all. But you say, that's me, Pastor Carl. Lift it up high. Just show, I just want to rejoice with you today. Anybody like that? Maybe you're watching on the broadcast and you received Christ today. We are so excited for you. And anybody, whether you raised your hands or not, if you receive Christ, that is the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. Maybe you didn't raise your hand because you didn't know. Afraid I'd call you out. Why don't you put on your communication card and say, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And, and, and let us get you some literature and, or something to help you grow in your walk with Christ now. We're excited for you, man. I tell you, we rejoice when people come to know Christ. Somebody's been praying for you. Father, we thank you so much. We rejoice, and God, we're just excited that, that you've got a purpose for our life. Let us be like David. Let us stand strong in you, God, knowing that you are the king and that, God, that any enemy that faces us, any circumstance, we know that you've got us and you will equip us with what we need for the battle. We don't need to live in fear because we've got you and let our lives reflect that. Father, we thank you and praise you for all decisions made here today. Thank you for your word. In Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Let's all stand to your feet.